Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. What a kind introduction. My name is Mildred and I am from Toronto. My dry date is May the 18th, 1973, and I'm delighted to be here. Hi. Hi. I'm also very nervous. When Lee called me and said, I'd like you to give a workshop, uh, I thought about it, and uh, I said I would like to do one on relationship as spiritual practice. And then I went about the business of putting some ideas together. And the reason I, I'm edgy, it's okay though. Last night I knew that I had to change, not the ideas, but to put them in a different context. So I'm going to put, the, I'm putting them in the context of my life. If they're, you know, as I see my life today, at 38 years in the program, as an active member, always having had a sponsor, always being sponsored, always having a home group, always studying the book, always into step work, the traditions, all that stuff. I see that really my problem has always been about relationship, and I didn't understand what was wrong. I was locked behind walls. How can you grow when you're locked behind walls? I don't see you properly. You are an object that's going to make me feel okay. And I'm behind the walls. I can't relate to you. And I put out that energy. Come on, make me okay. You don't want to make me okay. Not because you're bad, but because you can't. And then, when you don't make me feel okay, I'm angry. I'm depressed. And that's the energy I put out. And I wonder why people don't like me. And I wonder why people don't want to be around me. I understand that today. Obviously, Bill Wilson understood that because, uh, just taking a few quotes out of the big book, uh, the first one he says, But it is from our twisted relations with family, friends, and society at large that many of us have suffered the most. We are especially stubborn and stupid about them. I didn't put those words in. That's right in the 12 and 12. We're especially stubborn and stupid about them. And he goes on to say the primary fact that we fail to recognize is our total inability to form a true partnership with another human being. I looked at my family. I couldn't form a partnership with them. I didn't form a partnership with my parents. I didn't form a partnership anywhere along the way. I had lots of opportunities, but this belongs to me. And then he goes on to say in the 12 and 12, You know, which is where he's had some experience of life. He says, since defective relations with other human beings have nearly always been the immediate cause of our woes, no field of investigation could yield more satisfying and valuable rewards than this one. I didn't make that up either. And he goes on to say, we can go far beyond those things that were superficially wrong with us. Yeah, I knew what was superficially wrong with me. I was angry and acted that out and many other things. What is wrong with (laughs) (laughs) To see those things, those flaws which were basic, What's going on in here? Flaws which sometimes were responsible for the whole pattern of our lives. I think that's what I really saw yesterday on the plane. And last night as I went to my room and tried to put this together into some kind of sense, what I saw was 
me at the center and that this was what was wrong. He goes on to say, it's necessary that we extricate from an examination of our personal relations every bit of information about ourselves and our fundamental difficulties. Well, there goes most of my life. I'm a victim. It's your fault that I'm this way. Can't you see that I can't fix my life? And if you only cooperated with me, I'd be okay. Anybody identify with that? (laughs) Good, then we can just hop right along on this. (laughs) You notice in in the 12 and 12, he also says, it's a spiritual axiom. It's not Bill's thought. It's a spiritual axiom that if I am disturbed, I am the one in error. Take a look at what he says on page 164 of the big book. He says, see to it that your relationship with God is right and great things will come to pass for you and countless others. Now, I'm not here to preach a sermon, but I am here to tell you that it is only through getting right with God that I've been able to get right with myself and get right with you. Because until I understood who I am and that I'm not just a body, struggling around here to get men into my life and money and God knows what and being unsuccessful then getting stuff and not be, not being okay with it anyway so um he had some other things to say see and when we get to the isn't that what the steps are about every one of those steps is about relationship Then when we get to the traditions again, it's about how we stand on the planet as members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that first one, he says, our common welfare. I've got to be careful about what I'm doing because our common welfare makes it possible for people to, for me to be sober and for everybody. Um, And then in the second tradition, where he says God's will comes to us basically through the collective wisdom of everybody. So we don't have leaders. We don't have people who know better, who sit at the top of the pyramid and say, by God, if you could only I see what's right, this is what you have to do. Each one of us has to work that out for himself. And that's really what my life has been about. I'd like to quote from Scott Peck. I'm not a student of his. Scott is dead now, but I I nearly fainted when I read what he said. Alcoholism is a blessing. You've got to be kidding. (laughs) He said, we are all broken. He was talking about everybody, not just those of us who so-called have addictions. He said, we're all broken. The problem with us is it breaks us visibly. Our neighbors didn't understand when our front lawn was strewn with clothes. (laughs) They didn't understand when my car was put through a bay window. And I could go on and on. And when people left our house in a huff at 3 o'clock in the morning, he says, We're all broken, but alcoholism breaks us visibly. And he goes on to say, and forces us into community. I can tell you, community is not where I wanted to be. I didn't understand that. Look at the big book. What does it say? Self is the root of the problem. And in step eight in the 12 and 12, the very last statement is, This is the beginning of the end of isolation. See, if I'm going to be out of isolation, I've got to see who's out there. I don't like you because you interfere. Not now. (laughs) You interfere with me. I want to be at the center of the universe, and I want you to treat me that way. And if you don't, I'm going to be one unhappy camper. (laughs) Chuck Chamberlain, in the days when I was in AA, and I'll talk about that tonight, 
when I was in AA but stoned. It doesn't work too well. <laughs> and Chuck used to say, you think you're separate. I didn't understand. He was absolutely right. And if you've ta ever read that wonderful book, A uh, New Pair of Glasses, in there is that diagram, the circle and, you know, the various dots which represent us, and then there's that line and the little stick figure, and he'd say, that's you. You think you're separate. You think you're different. And, of course, that's the message of the ego. And as long as I'm listening to the message of the ego, I'm telling you I don't care about you. It's that simple. And if I don't care about you, my life is going to be in tatters as it was. I was 21 years sober, my dears, planning suicide. And I was a good member of AA in a faction. I, had, I was going to meetings. I had it all together. I looked good. You know, people respected me. I wasn't okay inside. See, one of the scientists who uh, won a, a Nobel Peace Prize, he put it this way. He says, the universe is a complicated web of interrelationships between the various parts of the whole. Wherever I am, I'm in relationship. I didn't know that. You said relationship to me, and I thought sex. <laughs> Men. Anybody identify with that? <laughs> or the mother I hate. There's another good relationship to focus on. A family I don't want to be part of. And so that one goes. And then there's Omerku. He says, we belong to something bigger and greater than ourselves. Imagine that. You know, as I stand up here this morning, I'm so glad I know this. Because I'm never alone anymore whether I'm in an airplane and I don't know the name of one other person, I'm not alone. If I'm in an airport or wherever I am, I'm not alone anymore because I belong to something bigger and greater than myself. And you and they all belong to some. There's none of us outside of this, whether we're awake to it or not. And, you know, I am... Um, I learned a lot about this from Eckhart Tolle, you know, where he says that divine being is our life and that there's nothing you could do to me to change that and there's nothing I could do to you. I think we've had it all wrong, this business of blaming and somebody has got to pay for this and we're victims and, you know, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't stand up for ourselves and hold people accountable. But I can tell you, if you do it from a place of anger, the results will not be good. See, our book is full of this change, you know. I love it because it's so strong and it's so invitational. It says, we're not saying that what other people did was right. What we're saying, it isn't my stuff. I've got enough of my own crap. I don't want yours. <laughs> I've got enough to deal with me. So, um, I'm going to use notes because I changed everything. <laughs> <laughs> My life has really come full circle. And it's come full circle, not easily. You know, I was a nun for 15 years. You'd think that would fix it. Yeah, right. <laughs> if you think being married is a trip. <laughs> Try 15 years with Mother Superior. <laughs> and the close of that is she wasn't the problem either. So, I see why drinking was such an unbelievable experience. I get it now. 
When I wasn't drinking, I heard those old voices that said, you're not okay, nobody cares about you, you're trapped, life sucks, nothing's ever going to change, you're stuck here, da-da-da-da-da-da. Anybody here? Yeah. I brought a whole page, three pages of those. <laughs> just, <laughs> just in case you don't know what you're hearing, you can... You can <laughs> I do a lot of this, and, and people tell me. I've got my own, but they tell me theirs, too. It's like showing me you theirs. Yeah, right. Uh, those feelings of isolation went away. That's what that good feeling is. Dr. David Hawkins, you know, in that book, Power Versus Force, I think it's called, he, he talks about, he studied alcoholism and addiction, and he says that's what alcohol does. It suppresses that part of us that is recounting this stuff from the unconscious. And when that's quiet, what's left? The voice of, then I can be in touch, maybe not consciously, but then it's quiet, and I'm peaceful, and then I feel loving, and the world is a wonderful place. It's not a place that I want to get away from, and that's what I chase. So when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I have to tell you, I was a hard little cookie. I'm not today. I'm really quite soft. Um, I have the capacity to care about people. I did not have that capacity. And tonight I will talk more about that, but... Bill says in the 12 and 12, in step 10, he describes how we come here. He says, we have loved but a few. We've been indifferent to the many, so long as they caused us no trouble. And we hated the rest. Well, that describes me in a way, but not quite. I hated everybody. I hated God. I hated the fact that I was here. And I hated everybody. How do you change? I said, 20 years sober, there was something about me was still strangely insane. See, I wasn't happy. Yeah, on the outside, I'd sit at a meeting. And I can tell you, when I talk about this, at um, even in a talk, after a while, I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, that's just the way I'm feeling. I'm 15, 16. You know, somehow or other, people sometimes, I think, have the idea, you get sober. And I hear people saying, you know, it just gets better and better. And I think, what planet do you live on? <laughs> I got sober, and I hurt inside the way I never hurt before. What do you do now? I have already had the experience of five and a half years in AA stoned, which doesn't work. <laughs> and I can't do that, and I'm not going to drink alcohol because the compulsion has been removed. I don't have to. But how do I live sober? How do I sit in those seats? And I look around me, and people are smiling, aren't they, Adrian? <laughs> They're smiling, and everybody seems to be happy. And one day I said, I don't know what else to do. The older members, see, I'm going to talk about the unconscious. I know that Dr. Bill said, Dr. Bill, doc, Dr. Bob said, let's keep this thing simple. And I think that's absolutely necessary. I think it's very simple to know how you function. You know, you better know how an egg beater functions and not use it to mix cement. <laughs> see, we better know how gravity functions. We better know how electricity functions if we're going to use it properly. What I didn't know was really what was wrong with me. I didn't know. I was a good member of AA. If you followed me, I promise you, you would have said, as people did, they'd say, you know, you intimidate me, and I thought it was a compliment. <laughs> That's how sick I was. What they were t really expressing was, I can't get close to you. That's, as far as I'm concerned today, that's hell. I don't need a hell in the afterlife. 
I've had hell here, being separated from you, being part of you, and not not being able to experience what that really involves. And so, um, yeah, I was thinking suicide, and I had another spiritual experience, and I knew it was going to be okay, and I'm telling you this now, because about three, I made up my mind, somehow or other, it'll be okay. I don't know. Three weeks later, a Jesuit called me, and he said, I'd like you to come out to Manresa and give a retreat. And I said, oh, my goodness, Father, you have no idea how many times I've been excommunicated. <laughs> and he said, he said, I don't care. He said, I want, and I went. And it was a bunch of women. Now, you alluded to your joy with women last night. I didn't like women either. You got in my way. I didn't know how to relate. I knew, see, if I think back, I knew how to be the teacher. I also knew how to be the person in big trouble saying, please help me, please help. I didn't know how to be on an even keel, one with you. No better, no worse, equal. That's what we're taught here, I believe, that I can look at you and it doesn't matter what your bank account is and it doesn't matter where you live and it doesn't matter what kind of house you live in and the clothes you wear. The fact is, God lives in you. That's my value. I believe that's your value. I didn't understand that. So I've, anyway, I did that retreat and uh, when I was finishing, I started to bawl. Now, I don't bawl in front of women. <laughs> this is not cool, <laughs> as the people say nowadays. I knew how to do a strategic tear in front of a man. <laughs> that's, that's a different business altogether. But to bawl in front of women... I don't think so, but I did. And I heard words come out of my mouth that I guarantee you came straight from the heart of God in me. I said I don't have a friend in the world. I was six, I think I was 61 or something like that at the time. And I didn't. I didn't have a friend in the world. I felt close to nobody. And as I said, I have lots of acquaintances. You see, I think that this taking down of the walls is a real grace. It's as big a grace as the compulsion and the obsession being lifted, and I never have had it back in 38 years. To have those walls come down put me in a position. I have no defense mechanisms. I have no pretenses left. And I have to tell you this morning, what you see is what you get. This is who I am. And I didn't know how to move out into that world and really participate. Like I said, I knew how to be in a position where, you know, I spent my life as an educator and so on. I knew how to do that. And I knew also how to grovel. I just didn't know how to be one with you. Now, what do you do with that? Well, I was at a Tolle seminar one day, and he said something which hit me right between the eyes. He talked about relationship, not with an S, relationship as spiritual practice. Think about it. If you want to be go into golf tournaments, you get a teacher and you then practice. As an educator... I went to university, and they taught me to do this and this and this, and then before they turned us loose into a school, we had to do practice. Chefs, if they're going to be an executive chef someplace, they learn, they practice, and then they go. Think about this. Relationship as spiritual practice. See, I think it's wonderful to grow spiritually through spiritual reading and meditation, and practicing the presence of God, and all those things. But what I also know is this. 
if what that is all about is not carried into the activities of my day, what use is it to me to read the book and say, oh yeah, uh, the book says either God is everything or nothing. I'm going to disbelieve that God is everything and then treat you like dirt. Something wrong there. See? Believe that God is everything and then judge you and criticize you. There's got to be a way around this, you see. And where is my Tolle quote? It's gorgeous. If I can find it, here it is. He says, So the eternal, the formless, the spirit is the essence of every human being. That doesn't leave anybody out. See, I tended to look at people by the outside. When the master was here, and this is not a religious concept, when the master was here, he said, we need to love everybody as ourselves. He didn't say you can leave anybody out. And when they nailed him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. You are me and I am you. And if then I ha am going to live that way, that's my spiritual practice. And I think when I find myself being critical and judgmental and like last night, Joy, what a lovely talk you gave. I giggled through the whole thing. <laughs> there would have been a time where what would have been going on was, I wish she weren't quite so good. <laughs> I might not look good. See? That's the kind of stuff that comes out of this idea of separation. And, the, you know, the kind of joy that comes from saying, go, go. That's your life experience, and you tell it beautifully. Wasn't it wonderful? Yeah. yeah. See, that's where I think life starts to, to really, imp the change in me starts to impact. Because if you see it different, he goes on to say, no matter how insane or conflict-ridden it may seem to appear on the surface, within every human being, that remains untouched. Our big book says it. It says, deep within, every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It is only there that he may be found. Deep within. So I've got to find a way when I look at you, instead of saying, well, I don't like the way she dresses. I don't like what she says. You know, and on with all that stuff, which is the way I used to look at everybody. This head and heart was a very busy place. I had to judge and criticize and assess everything to see how I stood in relationship to it. And he says, there's nothing that anybody could have done to you or nothing you could have done to others to destroy that. And that's why we can love everybody. The master never said, I have to like everybody. Possible. You're on something, honey, if you like everybody. <laughs> I don't have to approve of you. It's not my business. See, I really believe that statement where he says, see to it that your relationship with God is right, and then great things will come to pass. That's where I have to do the work. I used to do the work on the outside, manipulating, lying, cheating, doing whatever, ass-kissing, because I would assess what you might be able to do for me. And I wondered why relationships always went up in smoke. It's not a big mystery to me today. You know, I don't like, let me put it this way, I love it when I feel accepted and loved the way I am. 
I know I'm flawed. I don't always do everything right. But you know what? Knowing that, I know that that power lives within you and that you too are flawed. Why should there be two sets of ways of judging and criticizing? I don't need to do that because it's none of my business. See, as he says in step 10, it's a spiritual axiom that if I'm disturbed, I'm the one that has to change. So if I think about it, I live in God's world. Imagine this. And I'm not the center of the peace. Ouch. There are 6.8 billion of us, maybe more than that now. Plus, there are animals. I'm in relationship with everything. Oxygen, the air, people. I used to feel I was in relationship to nobody. Today, I feel I'm in relationship to this. I'm in relationship to gravity. I'm in relationship to the floor on which I stand and so on. And it's it's a completely different world. And as Tolle says, that's our spiritual practice. Not just relationships, individual people, but that's who I am. I'm a contingent being. I'm not the boss here. See, it's an amazing thing, this step one. You know, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. I admit I'm powerless over everything. And I don't need power. I don't need it. Because my life is unfolding. And this great reality that whose world this is and who lives within is guiding I remember, I better get on. (laughs) I can tell you when those walls came down, I was uncomfortable in my own skin. See, and I think Bill understood it because he says, there's a price to be paid, the destruction of self-centeredness. And in step three, he says, the root of the problem is self. I can't think this way as long as I don't know this. If I want to be in the center of the peace and carry on from there, see, I look at my relationships now, my relationship with my retarded sister. I used to think I was loving. No, I wasn't. I was pitying. I was, de- I was wanting her to be different than she was. And you see, if I believe the spiritual truth that i confronted with, everything is perfect just as it is. I may not feel good about some of the things, but God's in charge. I remember Tom Ivester one time, it just hit me right between the eyes. He said, you know, um, he said, I had, you know, he said, I had plans. And he said, all those plans that I had for my life went up in smoke. And he said, there has been a power that has guided me. And I heard him. I don't have to. You see, that there is a power that guides. Of course, we make decisions, and some of them go up in smoke. The more I realize what was wrong here, there was Dora. I wanted Dora to be different. Didn't like my mother because she didn't fix the world. And I, there was something going on between us. You know, I don't know. I think we live many times. I don't know. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> but I sure came onto the planet with a load of dislike for that woman. <laughs> Do I sense some identification out there? She was, everybody else loved her, but me. I didn't fit in the convent. The convent was a place to go because I'm going to force God to do my will. Oh, I didn't put it that crassly, but that's really what it was about. I don't want to go to a convent. I don't want to take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. 
but I will, God. And then I'll do your work, and then you'll do mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Infatuations. I loved men. Yeah. And as long as I was infatuated. And when that infatuation wore off, I was back to being me. I don't like you. I don't like sometimes the way you dress. I don't like this. I don't like that. Change. You know, is it any wonder I had a husband who beat me? I'd beat me too, I think. <laughs> no, I take that back. Nobody deserves to be beaten. But that relationship went up in smoke. I had a relationship with a man who couldn't stay sober. I got his ears in my hands, and I'm saying, pray, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and then I found a man. I always wanted men, and they had to be have certain qualifications. I didn't know what they were like inside. I didn't know what their values were, if they were handsome, if they were popular, if they had lots of money, and so on. That kind of man, yeah, come on in, fella. I'll give you sex. I'll give you what you want, and you're going to make me okay because you've got the things that I thought I didn't have and the things that I thought were going to make me okay. And then at 20 years, as I told you, uh, reality hit. And by that time, I'd made lots of money, and I had an ideal life. So what? I wasn't okay in here. And one day, one of my buddies came over, and he's a man who reads the books. He studies them. And I'm telling him how bad I feel. I better get going. <laughs> and uh, he said... Uh, he quoted something. He said, we've had experiences um, in childhood. See, when I came in, people, would, people said, don't worry about childhood. Yeah, I, I'm not talking inner child. We're going to spank that little one and send it away because it's all, I think, about self-centeredness. But this idea of what happens to us in childhood and that we are the product of that. Of course we are. Science will tell you that from zero, we're, we're affected by our mothers in the womb. And then we're born and the first two years, they say we are in a hypnagogic state, like hypnotized. Our brain waves, can, baby's brain waves can be measured, and we suck in what happens, and we learn stuff, and that continues till we're six, and then a, another whole way of seeing the world. What do we learn? What did I learn? Well, anyway, he quoted this to me. We've had experiences in childhood below the level of consciousness at the time of these occurrences, they have given our emotions violent twists, which have since discolored our personalities and altered our lives for the worse. And I'm telling you, I believe that if people were taught that, I don't mean just people with addiction. If we understood how we function, we'd have a different world. Because we learn the lies of the ego. One way or another, we learn, I'm not okay, and you have to make me okay. I said to Ted, you shouldn't be quoting. That's way too psychological. <laughs> and he yelled at me, get your 12 and 12, in about that tone. I got it. There it was, written by Bill Wilson in Step 8, where he's talking about getting to know, hi there, I love you, too. <laughs> uh, where he's talking about childhood. And I happen to know, I can't find it, but 
I did read that Bill in his rela- in his relationship with Father Ed Dowling, that was one of the things he talked about was how how in childhood he felt pushed aside. He felt that his mother didn't care about him. It wasn't the truth, but he felt that, and he said, I better be number one. This was not written by a psychologist. This was written by Bill Wilson, because I think he believed it to be the truth. He understood how he functioned. See, I think we needed both Dr. Bob and Bill. I relate much more to Bill. He was nuts like I am. (laughs) See, Dr. Bob, he came from a more, you know, from the Oxford tradition, and he got sober, and he went on to do 12-step work. Bill's out there hustling. How? Yeah, we got to go to some seances, and we got to take a little (laughs) LSD, and we got to find out whether niacin is going to work and all that stuff. See, because... And he says it in that article he wrote when he was 25 or so years sober, that emotional sobriety, where he says, I, why doesn't it work? God's grace takes away the compulsion to drink. Why doesn't it take away my depression? Then I'm trying the prayer of St. Francis. Why doesn't that work? And so he goes on and on, and finally he says, I got it. I got it. It was my dependence, almost complete, on people, circumstances, and events. Imagine going out into life. I didn't know that's what I had within. Remember the Aaron Brockovich movie? There was toxic waste buried there. And they were grateful when that was discovered because that toxic waste was sending up fumes. I had toxic waste buried in me because what I sucked up as a child was nobody cares about me. If you cared about me, you'd fix Dora. Case closed. See, I'm not okay. Life is scary. I'm not important. Now, what's the the importance of that? How does that function? Well, I'll tell you, I didn't understand myself. And after Ted talked to me, after we read this, he said, Bill wrote that. And that's where Bill says, we can go far beyond what is superficially wrong with me. See, I didn't, I thought I was weird. I didn't understand myself. Before this had happened, this last boyfriend I had and I, we were in Paris. And the last night we were there, we were in this fine hotel in the lobby, perfect, you know, a fireplace, a three-piece combo, and we're having this lovely, lovely evening together before we head back to Toronto. And uh, the door opens, and in walk three people that we had met at a party in Paris. They were glad to see us. And my face got about two feet long. I didn't understand why. I just knew I wanted them to die. (laughs) Get out of here. You're interrupting what's happening here. And it wasn't long before Miss Mildred is very noticeably sitting there with this long face. And they say, what's wrong? And I say, Oh, I've got sisters out there. (laughs) Alter egos. Yeah. Nothing. And I sit there some more, and it's embarrassing. They're all having a good time. And I can't, I I want to, but I can't snap out of it. And uh, finally, I got it. Do you know what my next move is? You know what? I think I ate something at supper that didn't agree with me. My stomach, that's socially acceptable. The socially acceptable untruth of why I behave like a jackass. (laughs) And everybody, you know, expressed appropriate, you know, hope you're feeling better. And I went away. 
one more time feeling, what the hell is wrong with me? I could go on and on. That's the way I lived. I didn't understand. Now, after um, after Ted spoke to me that time, I've always found that when I'm ready, the teacher always shows up. And somebody was put in my path, and I came to the States. You know, I love you Americans. God, I love you. Because when I think about my life and think about the good things that I've learned, most of them, it isn't that Canadians aren't spiritually developed. (laughs) It just seems that people have come into my path. They're all Americans like Chuck Chamberlain and Wesley Parrish and Willard Pegg, and I could go on and on, who taught me stuff who loved me like Doug Richardson, you know, and I could go on with that. Anyway, I went and I learned something. Let me go back just just a, a, a little bit. See, I'll say what's here. If you can't see it, we'll leave it, and if you want anything further, you know, I can give that to you. Right from the big book. Well, I don't need the big book to tell me that I live in my human experiences. But the big book says, deep within every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It is only there. So I just put life force. and Because I believe that life force is in everything. It's in the animals, the trees, the flowers, the insects, the snakes, the oxygen, etc., But on page 23, the book tells me something that I need to know. The main problem rests in the mind. The main problem, rather than in the body. It's right there. And I used to bypass it because I thought when he's talking mind, he's talking intellect. I'm smart. Nothing wrong with my intellect. Doesn't belong to me. And one of the old-timers, God bless him, took me aside. And he said, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about your inner world. See, what what part is it? Isn't it when you feel lousy? Isn't it in here? What? Where does it come from? My old beliefs. I'm not okay. Something is wrong with me. You should fix it. I hate you. I hate life. And I could go on and on with all that. My old beliefs, my old ideas. You know, God should fix it. What's wrong with that twit? You know, (laughs) they say he's love and power. I've got a problem. Why doesn't he fix it? See, those old ideas, memories, my sister Dora crying and me crying. And I'm three years old. And I can't fix it. Memories. All that childhood stuff. See, it's buried in there. And if we pay attention to it, we begin to see some things. See, what he taught me was this. We went through my life and that childhood piece. And I began to see that in my unconscious, what I've got in there is this, big time. I'm not okay. Nobody cares about me. I've got proof. This is the way I thought. If you loved me, you'd fix my sister, Dora. You're my big brothers and sisters. I can't fix it. It's up to you, and you don't fix it. My conclusion was, I'm not important. My conclusion was nothing ever changes. I keep crying every night and nobody fixes it. We've all got our stories. And I don't think those stories are there to keep us stuck. They're there so we can get free of them. In the third step prayer, it talks about the bondage of self. Relieve me of the bondage. The bondage of self to me was those old belief systems. Because when those old belief systems came up, so did the feelings of childhood. You know, I often have people come, and maybe they're 40 or 50 or 60 years old, 
and they'll say, I think I'm crazy. (laughs) Why? And then they go on to describe how they feel. No, you're not crazy, because when the old belief system comes up, so do the feelings that you had in childhood. Caroline. Yes? Are you Caroline? Hmm? Okay. I just thought of something. I didn't say thank you to Caroline. She treated me so well yesterday. (laughs) Talk about stream of consciousness. Okay, you see, if we take this model and you think about this, here's the life force within me, it wants to express through me, then why does my life look like such crap? Because it's got to go through this business. I'm alone. You're wrong. Nothing ever changes. I'm not good enough. Nobody cares. And when that shows up in my life, it's not a pretty picture. See, if you understand this, then the work is not changing the outside. The work is changing the inside. So if I come to to meetings, and now I believe God is everything. Spirit is. God is love. Uh, see to it that your relationship with God is right. Spiritual principles will solve all my problems. All that I have is thine. The Father and I are one. And I could fill that with all kinds of those ideas. My life is going to look different, just as my life does. Because what I learned from that man was this. How does this function? And then I'll bring this to a close. Am I okay time wisely? Okay. Uh, I'm a teacher by, I guess I'm an educator by birth. I think I was born with chalk in my hands. (laughs) And uh, what I have learned is also how I learn. I like pictures, I like metaphors, I like comparisons. And the one that I like is this. I like to compare my unconscious to a pond with mud in it. Now the mud sinks to the bottom, and the top is nice and straight, and you can see the sunshine and the moonshine on it, and it's lovely. And then somebody comes along and throws a boulder into that pond and disturbs that mud. And the mud comes roaring to the top. And now you don't see any sunshine and you don't see any moonshine. You just see that because it can't be reflected on that mud. See? How does that compare? Well, see, we have Dr. Carl Jung here. And Bill said he considered him one of the co-founders of AA because of what we learned from him. And he talked about the unconscious, and he talked about this stuff. This is where the old beliefs are. I am not okay, etc. Now, nobody comes and throws a physical rock in my pond, but you come across my path and you don't treat me the way I want to be treated. Or I go to the meeting and somebody's sitting there and they don't bother saying hello to me. That's the rock in my pond. Or it's the boyfriend and he doesn't do things right. It can be anything. I don't think people get honest to God. I don't think people get up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to throw a rock in that bitch's pond today. (laughs) I really don't. I don't get up and decide who I'm going to disturb today. Excuse me, I should... You used that word too last night, too. See... 
the rock gets thrown in my pond, and this is why relationship is so important. If I don't face what's going on within me, I will keep repeating the same old stuff over and over, and you can run to all the meetings you want. You can say all the prayers you want, and if you don't get right inside, that's what I found. Until I could face what was really going on, and that it was the hatred in here. It was the way I saw you that had to get made right. And once through meditation, prayer, spiritual reading, practicing the presence of God, becoming aware of my behavior, becoming aware of the energy I put out that things could change. I'm going to tell you just one, one story. Uh, oh, things have absolutely changed. My life is so different today. It, it's unbelievable to me. Uh, but I've got a long way to go. Because there are days when I know I still put, I, where I'm not right. And I've got to get right. And, uh, um, I want to just say a thing about family. And then we'll close. Uh, I didn't like my family. I didn't like being born in Saskatchewan. I didn't like being on a farm. I didn't think I liked being Roman Catholic, and I thought it was gross that we were ten kids, and we were German. Other than that, everything was fine. (laughs) Hated, hated everything I could look at. And I was the baby, and everybody else was a lot older than me, so I was kind of like uh, an only, in a sense, an only child. But there were those brothers and sisters of mine who really were lovely people. They were wonderful people, but I didn't see that then, and I shoved them aside. And I didn't have the capacity to really love God. I didn't have the capacity to love myself. I didn't have the capacity to love them. And of those ten, seven are gone. And as this last couple of years of change have have gone on, I would so love to see them. I would so love to let them know how wonderful they really were. You know, I can look at them now and I can see what wonderful characters they were. But... It came to me in the last year. You've got 35 nieces and nephews. Why are you so isolated from them? Why do you always arrange your going home to Saskatchewan so you don't have to stay? That you go there, you kind of fly in, you have a dinner, and you're gone again. And I thought, if you don't have family, that's your problem. So I made it my business this, well, two summers ago, and then again this summer. And, you know, the the change in that whole family relationship is just amazing. I can't tell you I don't have children. I took care of that twice. Shame on me. You know, the book says we made decisions based on self, which later put us in a position to be hurt. Loved your stories about your boys. Fabulous. But, you know, those nieces and nephews have really responded. And I really feel today that I have a family, a blood family, because I've had my spiritual family here. And that has been part of the healing. And now I better bring this to a close. See, this isn't about Pollyanna. And it's not about pouring pink paint on anything. It's about getting real, getting right into the dance where people are, where you have to interact with people and do what really happens. You know, I often think of a dance floor. You get onto a dance floor, and one day you get an elbow in the mouth. 
and somebody steps on your toes. See, that's what I didn't want to have happen because I didn't know how to handle it. Today I know that I can go to that place and say this is not the truth. God, you live within me and so on and so on. You've been wonderful. Thank you so much. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.